Um, I'd like to call to order the um, regulatory advisory rhinoplasty uh, session. Uh, we're going to start out uh, with Peter uh, Rubin, uh, the science of FDA regulations of fat grafting and stem cells, what you need to know in 2017. Peter, I'm told you have 30 minutes, is that right? 30 minutes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, good morning. This talk is going to cover uh, a little bit about the science of fat grafting. It's going to be very complementary to Roger's talk that he showed, uh, as well as uh, covering what's going on with the FDA, and that's something that we all need to know about. <coughs> my disclosures will not impact the content of my talk today. So what do we want to know about fat grafting? Well, we want to know why is it so hard to compare the effect of different techniques how can we make it more predictable? Uh, what are the principles that we know to be true? And how are we getting those data? And what's the science behind the practice? Is there science? How are we measuring outcomes? And what is the uh, FDA working on uh, relative to fat crafting and how does that impact us? And we, you know, we saw Roger present a lot of principles and I'm gonna uh, present uh, uh, an approach that's very complementary to that. And you're gonna see a little bit of of overlap in principles, but coming from a little bit of a different perspective. So first, you know, really highlighting the, uh, the prevalence of fat grafting, especially to the breast, and how this has truly revolutionized what we're doing. Uh, this is survey data that, that our group published in 2013. And we asked the question, are you doing fat grafting to the breast? We asked this of board certified plastic surgeons and we were surprised at the time that 70% said yes, uh, we are doing this. And that, that was a very high number. Uh, further in this survey, uh, we had uh, looked at methodology. And we asked some of the same questions that uh, Kaufman asked in the paper that he published in PRS in 2007. So for some of the techniques, we could update the information. And we found that uh, when this, these questions were asked in 2007, about half of the people were centrifuging, a third washing, 12% uh, using other secret methods, and 12% doing nothing. And over time, uh, only about a third of us are filtering, uh, are centrifuging the fat now, and an equal number are filtering the fat. So these techniques, first of all, are in evolution, and secondly, they remain incredibly varied and diverse. And we see this. We, we've seen this for a long time in the, the, all the different techniques that we can use. Uh, Sid Coleman's very elegant harvest of small aliquot centrifugation uh, and uh, wicking of the oil uh, to uh, larger volumes, volume methods. This is uh, Tino Mendieta's uh, back table in his OR, uh, with a big Williams Sonoma strainer. And all of these things seem to be working in different applications from a processing perspective. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, see the variation and we need to get a little bit behind uh, some of the science behind this. And then there are all sorts of hybrid methods. This is an author who published on the use of cheesecloth for filtering the fat, like he's making mozzarella. And we ask again, where is the science versus the anecdotal practice? Because so much of this is based on anecdotal practice. When something's working, uh, people will emulate those techniques. So this is a bit complicated because there's so many variables that we have to consider. From harvest site, individual patient variation, and this is actually more important than we think, and I'll show some data on that in a little while. Uh, use of wetting solutions and epinephrine, harvest method, processing, and that's really gotten the most attention, uh, washing, adding different agents, the injection method, and the recipient site uh, and its manipulation, as we saw in Roger's talk, using both the Brava, uh, using uh, methods to uh, mesh the tissue uh, as well. And it's further complicated by a plethora of commercial products. And we see some of them in our exhibit hall here, but you look around the landscape and there's all sorts of devices uh, that you can use to process fat tissue. Uh, and then big expensive devices, uh, machines that cost tens of thousands of dollars uh, that you can bring into the OR that, that will 
use water to disrupt the, the tissue. So again, real range of technologies out there uh, that you can use. And then uh, that's just for the harvesting side and the processing side. And then you look at uh, delivery uh, and harvest cannulas and you have more variables added uh, because you look at cannula diameter, uh, you look at uh, <clears throat> aperture size, and this will influence particle size, flow rate, and shear stress. And shear stress is becoming recognized as a very important variable, uh, as we saw from uh, Jay Austin's group in, in Mass General. And then for delivery, we can use hand injection, we can use different ratcheted uh, pumps, uh, or even mechanical pumps. So all of these are variables, variables that impact our ability to understand how outcomes are, are affected because it's really hard to isolate these variables. So where can we find useful data? Well, we can look at scientific studies of fat grafting, and we have to ask, what are we really measuring, and is this actually clinically relevant? And I'll argue that graft survival and quality uh, are key, uh, and that we shouldn't really be using surrogate measures uh, to base our therapies. But what about clinical studies of graft survival? Well, Many of the clinical studies uh, have not really quantified uh, graft uh, survival or, or outcomes, but they will measure patient satisfaction. Uh, and <clears throat> accurate physical measurements of the outcomes is much less common, but, but there are some that we can look at and some that, that we can find useful. So a big problem with scientific studies of fat grafting processing methods is that they are often done uh, in vitro and that in vitro uh, be, uh, measure becomes a surrogate uh, for actually putting the fat into a living system, which we can do in an immune deficient rodent model. And this is really developed as a very, very useful method uh, for looking at fat grafting healing. And this is commonly used, uh, this model, it's, it's commonly published uh, in our literature, uh, and it's actually very useful at isolating and looking at the impact of these variables. Because it's very problematic when studies look at these surrogate measures such as adipocyte cell viability at harvest. That's just a single snapshot in time that does not permit, uh, predict the biological behavior during healing or tissue remodeling. So all of these people are alive and all of your fat cells might be alive or a great proportion of them, but which ones do you want healing your wounds? I would you know, pick the more robust ones. Uh, but you're not gonna get a measure like that just with viability. You're not gonna get that kind of predictive uh, value. And we see this in some studies. Here's a study that was done uh, by our colleagues in, uh, in, in Turkey, and they looked at cannula size as a variable, both on harvest and injection. And they looked at adipocyte viability. And what they found is that bigger cannulas for harvest and injection gave you more adipocyte viability. Therefore, they said this can potentially improve graft survival, but they didn't measure graft survival. And in fact, uh, if you look at their methodology, and we really need to be critical of the methodology in these studies, uh, what they did was they took fat particles and they digested them with collagenase, and they looked at the viability of the free adipocytes. Well, the bigger the particles, the more likely it is that the adipocytes are going to survive in the center uh, of this particle. So it's a very uh, variable and, and sometimes flawed uh, technique. And particle size in itself is a variable that's still poorly understood in fat graft survival. So these measures become less clinically relevant. Most certainly if all the fat is dead, that's bad. Uh, but I don't know what to do with the difference between 70% viability and 80% viability without putting it into an immune deficient uh, rodent model. So an example of this uh, and, and some of the newer variables that we're thinking about include shear stress. Uh, so this was um, a group at Mass General uh, that took fat and they subjected it to two different injection techniques that varied the shear stress. And what they found is that they could get very high shear uh, with a very rapid injection in a narrow cannula. And when they put the fat in animals, they actually saw a difference in the amount of mass that was generated uh, from the initial injection. Uh, so that is, is certainly something we have to consider as a variable and uh, something that is very measurable. So I'll give you another example of how these um, 
in vitro measures can be very discordant uh, from what we're really seeing uh, in a living system. So here is a study where they looked at two different methods of harvesting and six different ways of processing. So they had 12 groups. They centrifuged, they washed with different solutions, and then they measured uh, a, a viability using a viability assay. This is a dye reduction study, and they found a couple of groups that you'd say, wow, I don't want to put these in my patients. But when they put everything in animals and looked at the healing, it was pretty much all the same across the board, there's very little difference. So again, we need to be cautious of those surrogate measures in, unless we can actually verify uh, that they are relevant to healing. Now what about centrifugation? Do we really need to do this? How important is it? Well, when we centrifuge, we talk about the, the time, we talk about the speed, but we're really interested in the g-force, and that varies uh, proportionate uh, to the length of the uh, rotor arm uh, and the square of the speed. Uh, so the faster you're spinning with a given rotor, uh, you're going to have an exponential increase in your g-force. So at 3,000 RPMs, that tabletop centrifuge will give us about 1,200 g's, and that's a pretty common measurement. And the best study looking at the impact of this variable was done by Kataro Yoshimura's group, and they uh, looked at at uh, fat that was harvested, they centrifuged at a number of different G-forces, and they could see the oil being derived, and they, they could look at how the fat was getting concentrated. Then they put it in animals, and what they found is that if you do centrifuge the fat, that more of what you put in uh, is going to uh, engraft, and, and we'll, you'll get more mass uh, after the treatment. Uh, but then they asked the question, well, is this really just an effect of concentrating the fat tissue. And the only reason we're seeing that difference is because we're pulling out the aqueous portion, the fluid portion, and um, otherwise the, the gram per gram fat survival would be the same. So they asked that question, they figured out how much they were concentrating the fat, they back calculated, and sure enough, that is what they found. And, and Roger mentioned this during his talk. And, you know, we're still working with these different concepts of percent, percent survival and, and uh, percent retention. Uh, but when they back calculated for the amount that they were concentrating the fat, yes, uh, it actually survived best on a gram per gram basis uh, when they didn't centrifuge it. But again, because you're moving the a removing the aqueous portion, uh, more of what you inject uh, is fat, and more of that will engraft and turn into the fat mass. The other component of centrifuging uh, that we need to consider is that we are getting a more dense fraction of tissue uh, in the bottom portion of the syringe when we centrifuge, and Sid Coleman and, and his colleagues have shown us that that, can, that fraction can have a, a better survival because of a higher concentration of the stem cells. So separating the aqueous layer is good, uh, if you want more concentrated fat, but you can do it through centrifugation, filtering, telfer rolling, and in fact, this is data from our lab where we took fat uh, and we treated it in different ways, and we got the best retention of or best uh, retention of the fat when we telfer rolled it. So uh, more of what we put in uh, turned into uh, the final result of, of healed fat uh, when we telfer rolled it. So aside from processing methods, uh, a really big question is, are there inherent qualities of each patient's fat that can affect graft outcomes? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to, to uh, 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 digress for a few minutes uh, to talk about the role of adipose stem cells uh, in fat tissue, uh, because these are cells that live in the connective tissue of fat. They don't have lipid in them. They're immature cells. In this case, we see a micrograph where uh, progenitor cells are stained in red for CD34 antigen. And we can separate these cells and study them. We can do this through a collagenase digestion. And we call that initial isolate the stromal vascular fraction. When we plate them in culture, we call that the adipose stem cell fraction. And we can do this in clinically relevant uh, methods. 
uh, in GMP facilities. This is our lab at the University of Pittsburgh where we process cells for uh, clinical trials, and it can also be done with automated devices, uh, albeit uh, these devices are still considered experimental in the United States. And these cells, once harvested, have true multi-lineage potential, uh, which has given rise to a whole uh, host of publications across many disciplines over the years with adipose stem cells and given rise to a society. And if you don't know about IFATS, International Federation for Adipose Therapeutics and Science, uh, this is the, really the premier venue uh, for highlighting adipose-derived stem cell research for regenerative applications. Uh, this was uh, founded by uh, myself, Bill Futrell, uh, Adam Katz and Ramon Yui, and the 15th annual meeting is coming up in Miami Beach uh, it, at the end of November, beginning of December. Uh, so it's really a, a great place to see the current science across many disciplines. These cells, in addition to being uh, uh, very plastic, uh, have a great potential to release growth factors, especially angiogenic growth factors. Now, when we look at adipose stem cell concentration in different human subjects, there's actually a great variation from person to person. So we asked the question, will that impact fat graft survival? And we looked at a panel of four males and four females. We put their fat into animals and we looked at the results and there was a statistically significant correlation between the biologic properties of the fat and the fat graft survival. So this could actually be a surrogate measure that correlates with survival. And of course, uh, many of you have heard of the concept of cell-supplemented fat grafting where the adipose stem cells are added back into the graft to make them more bioactive. Uh, this uh, does work scientifically. Uh, as Roger showed, uh, we don't have good clinical data behind this, uh, but we can show this effect in animals, but it takes a lot of stem cells and it's high cost and there are a lot of regulatory hurdles. So we have to consider, if we're going to use these therapies, some of the other effects of the stem cells, and a very important effect is downregulation of inflammation. This is a mixed lymphocyte reaction uh, where we have cells that will proliferate very vigorously when stimulated by antigens. And what this graph shows is that adipose stem cells and bone marrow stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, will suppress that inflammatory response uh, very vigorously. So we combine that anti-inflammatory response with the growth factor release, and what we get is an effect on tissue remodeling, especially in injured tissues. And when we look in severely injured tissues, uh, we see an effect of more than just volume. So this is a, a patient from our Department of Defense study looking at pain at amputation sites. And not only do we build up volume, but in eight out of nine patients that we've treated in this randomized trial so far, uh, eight out of nine of them have uh, resolved or greatly decreased their phantom pain, even at rest, showing the anti-inflammatory effect. Here's another one of our wounded warriors with skin graft adherent to his thenar eminence. We put in a high concentration of his adipose stem cells with a, a small layer of fat, and we were able to get suppleness in the tissue. We were able to get some very nice remodeling and even releases contractures enough so that he could hold objects comfortably in his hand. And then radiated tissues, we're seeing the same thing. Uh, this is one of our patients at Pitt. Uh, she came to me uh, looking like this, had been radiated, severely contracted, and this was after uh, six months after her third round of fat grafting. Uh, so we can really get some you know, very, very uh, impressive tissue remodeling effects uh, in these patients. So now that we know about the role of stem cells and how they're the biologic engine, let's look at fat graft survival in humans. And I want to reference Dan Del Vecchio's data because he looked at 25 women who had breast reduction, uh, breast augmentation, excuse me, with fat, and he was able to measure uh, volume. And I want to point out a couple of things about his data because it's, it's really a very important data set because not only uh, does he show a fat retention uh, between 60 and 80 percent, but in every patient he treated, uh, the, um, uh, the absorption was very symmetrical. So where there was 50% retention in one breast, there was 50% in another breast. 
And these numbers are, are strikingly uh, uh, consistent uh, from patient to patient in their degree of symmetry. And that really supports this concept that the biologic characteristics of the fat uh, are very important. We looked at uh, patients with craniofacial injuries in our Department of Defense uh, clinical trials, and, and we used, in this case, Coleman technique. And we standardized the Coleman technique uh, by getting uh, Sid to be one of our co-investigators, and he flies out to Pittsburgh uh, to uh, do these cases with us. And we, we've treated a lot of patients together, and it's been a great collaboration. But we treated, in one of our cohorts, 20 subjects just with fat grafting. They had craniofacial deformities. We measured the volume with CT scan uh, th through the post-op course at defined points, out through nine months. And in some patients like this one, we treated them twice. And what we found uh, was that we had an average retention of about 63% and is stabilized at three months. Moreover, what we found is that when we retreated the patients, the volume curves for the second treatment almost overlaid the first treatment uh, almost exactly. So patients who were poor responders uh, on the first go around were poor responders on the second go around, even though we had already fat grafted that area once and it was better vascularized. We also found again that stem cell concentration was a good measure of potency. So what can we conclude from these studies on fat grafting techniques and processing? Well, we can say that retention, and, and I'll be careful, uh, as Roger pointed out, to not use the word fat survival, but 50 to 70% of what we inject can be expected to be retained and engrafted optimally. There's still a lot of variation in the processing techniques. And if there's a higher aqueous content in the graft, that's okay but you have to consider that volume when you inject it. It's not good, it's not bad. It, you just have to take that into consideration. And individual patient characteristics appear to be relevant. So there's no data on which to recommend a single treatment as best uh, right now. You have to consider the workflow, the safety, the efficiency, the cost. I'll tell you what I do, very small volumes, I tell for roll. It's very quick and efficient, moderate volume, 10 to 50 cc's, I'll centrifuge, I'll do the Coleman technique, and very large volume uh, for breast and buttock, I'll decant alone. So here's my setup on the OR field, very simple. I will uh, let it decant, I'll aspirate out uh, the fluid. I also like those containers that have a spigot at the bottom. I'll put it into a, a container with a pour spout, and the nurse will rack them on the back table for me for a second decant, and that's pretty much it. And uh, there it is in a, a 30 cc syringe, uh, getting ready for injection. So I'll shift gears for the last part of the talk and discuss the FDA. And if you're wondering what the FDA has to do with fat crafting, well, they actually have jurisdiction over anything that you take out of the body that's intended for implantation, whether you take that out of a living patient or a deceased patient. And they're proposing new rules. So when you look at how the FDA regulates human cells and tissues, there are three general categories. The lowest level of oversight covers things like skin grafts, tendon grafts. We do them, the FDA has jurisdiction, but we get a pass, we get an exception. The next level of risk and regulation is a category called human cell and tissue rules. In this category, the FDA exercises power given to it by the Public Health Service Act to control the spread of communicable diseases. And they wrote a rule book called 21 CFR 1271. This set of rules is primarily directed at manufacturers who make tissue products, but they have jurisdiction over what we do in the OR and they can reach back. And then the highest risk category is where the product uh, tissue or cells are considered a biologic drug. So how do they define an HCTP? Anything that comes out of the body intended for implantation into a human. Examples, acellular dermal matrix, hematopoietic stem cells, bone allograft. How do you know which tier you're in? You look at that rule book and they'll tell you. There are, you, you are either uh, exempted out uh, or you're a biologic drug or you are a human cell and tissue product based on two key factors. 
Is it minimally manipulated and intended for homologous use only? Homologous use means like and to like, same function in the recipient as the donor tissue. Minimal manipulation is a little more confusing. For cellular tissues, you shouldn't change the biologic characteristics. For structural tissues like bone, don't alter the biomechanical properties that would impact its use to support things. Gets a little, little sticky here because the FDA says a tissue is either structural or cellular. And remember, they write these rules on a foundation of the old rules. Once they get a framework in place, it's hard to alter the framework. How can you manipulate cells? Enzymatic digestion, culture expansion, freeze it. These are all methods of manipulation. So I mentioned you get an exception. Even though the FDA technically regulates skin that you take out of a patient for grafting, they give you a pass on that. It's called the same surgical procedure exception. What if you are manufacturing a human cell and tissue product, like some of the companies that sell a cellular dermal matrix? Well, you have a lot of rules to follow, a lot of record keeping. You have to register your facility with the FDA. What if you're making a biologic drug? Well, you're in for a 10 to 12 year um, course of study that's, that's probably gonna cost you know, $100 million at least. So what are the new rules the FDA is proposing and the challenges? Well, they issued over <clears throat> uh, recent times four draft guidance documents. Guidance documents are the FDA's perspective on what they're thinking, how the rules should be interpreted. And they covered a number of topics, and I'm going to go through them just very quickly. The first one is they went back to that same surgical procedure exception. And they said, I know you guys are doing a lot of stuff in the OR. Well, I want to remind you that this is a narrow exception. All we want to see you do is rinsing, cleansing, or sizing of the tissue. That's about as fancy as you can get. So if the ASPS, through our regulatory committee, and I'm the chair of the regulatory committee, uh, we developed some responses, and we asked questions. Will we morselize cartilage? We use uh, vasodilators. Can we, can we do some of these things? And, and we were just testing the waters, and I think the FDA was just testing the waters. Uh, but then, shortly after, they released another document on minimal manipulation, and they reminded us that a tissue can be either structural or cellular, and the rules are different. And skin is structural, so they really didn't do much with that. But they said fat is also structural. It's structural because in, in the FDA regulations, it provides padding, cushioning, and support. And I'll tell you, when we talk to the FDA about fat grafting, this is a critical distinction that we make. We make the distinction that fat transfer is a surgical procedure in current plastic surgery practice that falls under that exemption for same surgical procedure. We are not doing much with the tissue. Stem cell therapies involved an isolated cell product, and all of us who are fat grafting, we're not doing stem cell therapy. And the FDA wasn't really quite sure about this until we really emphasized that point. Now what about nanofat, emulsified fat, any of the other monikers you want to use? Well, be really careful about how you describe that because that really is this. It just crushed up a little bit. And make sure you keep that distinction in your mind. Don't call something crushed stem cell therapy or anything that sounds like stem cells because it's fat grafting. And we want to make sure the FDA doesn't misconstrue that. So the ASPS and, and, and also IFATS in our response, because we did this from IFATS as well, we responded that we need to talk more about the intended use because fat is a biologic material. I showed you those examples of, of tissue remodeling. So we need to really revisit that. And then they released another document just on adipose tissue. And they said, um, again, it's structural, don't, alter, don't take cells out, because if you take cells out with enzymes, the cells you take out aren't soft and squishy and providing padding, and the stuff you leave behind is no good either. That's more than minimally manipulated. And understand that these rules are not applied consistently across the board. 
There's a lot of subjectivity here. And most importantly, they said fat-derived products, tissue products applied to the breast represent non-homologous use. Non-homologous because the purpose of the breast is lactation. So obviously we responded uh, from the perspective of a plastic surgeon, and I'll show you, this is a slide that we showed the FDA at their open hearings and at some other meetings that we had with them to show them that the breast was full of fat so, and it was a structural component. We also argued that the breast is a secondary sex organ, lactation is very limited, uh, and breast reconstruction is mandated by federal legislation. And none of it restores lactation, and fat is our best product for that. So we responded with all of these points, and uh, by the way, you can see uh, in a publication that's coming out very soon, this will be online soon, uh, this, this is an article about this whole process that we went through with the FDA and PRS, and you can see the uh, responses submitted from, uh, the FDA, to the FDA from ASPS. So what's their current stance? Well, they're moving toward greater restriction of cell therapies. Uh, they held public hearings in September, and the, the final ruling is not out yet. And the good news is that we don't think there's going to be a final ruling this year because they usually put it on the docket. And uh, that's a good thing. They don't ever have to release a final ruling. They can just sort of bury these and let these die. Uh, but it's really taken up a lot of time and energy to address these issues and keep these things alive. So I'm, I'm just going to take two minutes and finish uh, by talking about threats to fat grafting and stem cell therapies. So threat number one, rogue, spurious clinics with unqualified people offering unproven techniques and calling them stem cell therapies. This guy's in my backyard. He's in Pittsburgh. This is the Pittsburgh Stem Cell Institute. This fellow is not board certified by an ABMS uh, uh, board, and he's offering stem cell therapies in his clinic. And he has very flashy ads for this. And he says, is this approved by the FDA? And he frankly misquotes and uses the argument of practice of medicine and has a rationale that is not true for that. Moreover, this is the disclaimer on his website saying that by offering the stem cell therapy, his institute does not claim to cure any condition, disease, or injury. But yet, people are going and spending a lot of money on this. Recently, we saw an article in the New York Times about patients losing sight after stem cells are injected into their eyes. This is not a problem so much with stem cells. This was a problem with unqualified practitioners doing dangerous things. I was on an FDA panel with the ophthalmologist who identified the cases and wrote about them. All three patients thought they were participating in a research trial. They were never given a research consent. All three patients had macular degeneration. All three of them were treated by unqualified practitioners, no ophthalmologist on site, both eyes treated at the exact same time. All of them had quite disastrous outcomes and, and went blind. So we have to put credible science behind this uh, so that the field can evolve. Uh, otherwise, it will quickly become incredible. And then finally, an even bigger threat and more immediate threat is the problem with mortality from fat grafting to the buttocks. This was the paper uh, that the um, uh, ASAPs uh, and ASERF task force had put together highlighting that there is a much higher risk of mortality from this operation from the data that we know about. And this is really hitting the news. Roger mentioned this in his talk, three deaths and two hospitalized patients uh, in a fairly short period of time. Uh, and this is just heartbreaking stories that are hitting the news uh, about these patients who are dying after these procedures. Uh, so we're seeing for the first time in a long time a true inter-society task force being formed uh, across ASPS, ASAPs, ISAPs, ISPRESS, IFATS, and uh, we really got to put some, a lot of energy into understanding why these deaths are happening. Uh, and how we can prevent them. And then finally, uh, if you're not signed up for the graft registry, entering your fat graft uh, cases, please uh, do so so we have the good data. Thanks very much for your attention.
Thank you, Peter. Uh, that was great. Um, a, a really important update. Would like to introduce our next speaker, Shifting Gears. Mark Constantin is going to tell us uh, understanding rhinoplasty in 45 minutes. Mark? Thanks, Tim. This is not meant to be a joke title. I really hope that in 45 minutes you will have an idea about the big principles of rhinoplasty. I think they're not emphasized enough. There's a lot of technical technique um, discussed in rhinoplasty, not enough of the huge, huge ideas, and that's what I want to give you as huge ideas this morning. I have no disclosures that have to do with this presentation. So let's boil it down to the basic essentials. What are the two goals of most rhinoplasties? A straight profile that looks good and an optimal airway. Now you can make a little adjustments to those, but basically that's it. So how do you get that? You get a straight profile that looks good with adequate tip projection and an optimal nasal proportion and an optimal airway with, a, with no septal or turbinate obstruction and stable internal and external valves. So let's look at each of those things. A straight profile that looks good depends on adequate tip projection. And the importance of tip projection is that you can't have a straight profile unless the tip is adequately projecting. There's a lot of ways to define this, but the simplest way to think of it is that projecting tips are strong tips. They have strong cartilage enough to hold the tip up. Inadequately projecting tips are weak tips. That's the only difference between them. So tip support has to be independent of the height of the bridge. If the tip is held up by the bridge like it is in the patient in the center here where the tip hangs off the septal angle, that's inadequate projection. When the tip is projects beyond the septal angle or up to the septal angle, that's adequate projection. Without adequate projection, you can't have adequate, uh, you can't have a straight profile, and the key is the relationship of the tip to the septal angle. And the, the factor that makes that difference is the volume of structure right in that area, which Jack Sheen described as the middle crust. It's the length of the cartilaginous segment in that segment of tip cartilage. That's why tip grafts make so much sense. Now, the other distinction you need to make is between projection and size. Projection is cartilage strength. Size is skin volume. They're two different things. So you can have, in these three patients, large bases with strong cartilages. And in these three patients, large bases with weak cartilages. This is not excessive tip projection. This is still inadequate projection. It's just that these patients have a lot of skin in the lower nose. In these three slides, the woman on the left is a patient of mine from some years ago with inadequate projection. This blue line indicates the length the tip lobule ought to be. In the center, the length that I made it. You see those lines are the same. But on the left, the line extends beyond the skin because that segment is too short. So let me show you how I do tip grafts. This is all undissected now. So my incision will be infracartilaginous behind the soft triangle and then around here, just enough to get in there. And then as I dissect, I'm trying to feel where I want the augmentation to go and see what I want to have augmented. The mistakes I always made in the beginning were not, not putting my grafts high enough. You can't, tip grafts don't contract, the tip skin doesn't contract around the grafts. The grafts convert the shape of the tip. You have to see it on the table. This is the kind of shape change I'm trying to make. You see the effect of the, the tip projection comes from this length. Now I've crushed this cartilage a little bit. Mush won't survive. Rigid pieces would be obviously visible even under this thick skin. And so this is pliable, but it still has some substance to it because if it's too soft, it won't lift this, this type of skin. So I'll tuck some in. I'm going to put some in over toward her right. I've left it particularly long because <coughs> it may be longer than it needs to be. I'll put the first piece in over toward Donna's side as if I'm raising the dome on that side. And you see the difference? 
This actually is actually done exactly what I said, which is to drop this area a little bit. But that's not, that's not bad, that's not excessive. But this, so now she has a flat super tip and a defined point of tip projection. Here's the second graft. One is going in this way. I wouldn't swear I know where all these end up. I think I know where they end up. I mean, I know where I think I'm putting them. You can see right where this one is going, over toward my side. I'm trying to get symmetry and fold it into the pocket without getting too much projection. The relationships we have now are exactly the reverse of what we had. Preoperatively, the radix was low, the dorsum was high, and the tip hung. Now the radix is here instead of there. The dorsum is straight, the tip projects beyond the septal angle, and the contour of the tip is exactly backwards from what it was. Poorly shaped tip lobules have a convex super tip and a point of projection that is low and undefined, and the mass of the tip lobule is cephalad. In this lady now, the point of projection is right here, maximum projection, it's high, and the super tip is flat, and the mass of the lobule is down there. Okay, now how do you get optimal nasal proportion? That depends upon balancing the size of the lower nose and the length of the bridge. In these two, profiles, the red lines are exactly the same length. When I take them away, the nose on the right, on your right, looks larger at the bottom than the nose on your left, simply because on the left, the radix begins at the upper lash margin, on the right, at about the middle of the eye. Simply the difference of that length makes a difference in nasal proportion and therefore makes the profile look better. That works in reverse. If you have a patient with a high dorsum and you reduce it, the base will start looking bigger and out of, out of balance. If a low radix or low dorsum is corrected, as I did in this woman some years ago, and you raise the radix from that point to that point, even though I have increased the size of the tip, I have this, you see the point from the front end of, anterior end of the, of the nostril to the skin is longer on your right than on your left. That means because I've added tip graft, so that tip in the base in millimeters is bigger on the right than on the left, but it looks smaller because the radix is higher. So good proportion always makes a nose look better. And the advantage, one of the advantages is that when you have skin like this that is heavy and aged, you will, you're not asking the skin to shrink in a way that's not possible. In, the, in reverse, if you have a high radix and a very flat a nasal facial angle and you reduce it, it improves the, the relationship and the contour between the size of the base and the height of the bridge. So in order to raise the radix, you need to be able to get a graft in that looks good, and this is how I do so that. So I've trimmed the edges. Remember, it was very thick. It was the piece I got toward the dorsal edge. When I cut it, this is what it did at the end, and here is the little sliver that I cut off it. So there is your proof that septal cartilage has internal stresses. It just is tricky to work with as rib. But this I have weakened and scored, so when I put it in the nose, it lies flat, so that's all right. And I'm taking the roof, cartilaginous roof, and I'm going to suture that to the undersurface because I need it slightly thicker at the root than it currently is. And this piece happened to be. It's just a 5-0 plane. This is about the only place I suture anything. It just gives me time to get the graft in position and tape on. Okay. So this is my final radix graft. Um, in this particular case, it's about 20 seven millimeters long, the cephalic end, maybe six millimeters wide, tapering uh, to about four, but that's what the septum gave us. So this is where it will go right here. I want the radix to start here instead of there, where it was preoperatively. So now radix begins here. I can feel the cephalic end of the graft. 
I don't feel the, I can barely feel the edges, but I see the effect, which is exactly what I want. Okay, now how do you get an optimal airway? You need a good straight septal partition, inferior turbinates that are not excessively large, but you also need stable sidewalls in the in middle and lower thirds. The valves are the other side of every airway, and that's a very forgotten thought, and it's a critical point. The middle third is the internal valves, the si middle third of the sidewall is the internal valves, and it is affected by the height of the dorsum and the width of the middle vault. If you have air going through the nose, normally like it does, at up to 50 miles an hour, if the sidewalls are weak, uh, they, they, even if the septum is straight and the sidewalls collapse on inspiration, the patient won't have an airway. This man happens to have short nasal bones, another anatomic variation that Jack Sheen identified. The shorter the nasal bone, the longer the proportion of cartilage is supply, the proportion of sidewall that is only cartilaginous. So most patients with short nasal bones have internal valvular incompetence. This man's whole sidewall collapses when he inspires. In the mid-90s, I reported at this meeting, and then published in my book um, in 2009, a study we did over 16 years, um, more than 4,500 individual random manometric measurements on 600 patients measured before and after different kinds of functional surgery, because I had been doing spreader grafts and ailer wall grafts and dorsal grafts already for at least uh, 15 years at that point, <clears throat> 10 years for the spreader grafts since they've been described <clears throat> Excuse me, but I didn't know how much better they made the airway, and I wanted to know. Our median follow-up was 27 months, mean follow-up. Median follow-up <clears throat> was 14.3 months, and a quarter of the patients were followed for more than a year. If you have a septum that's deviated and you correct it, <clears throat> and that's all you do, you get more flow through the side toward which the septum is deviated, but the total amount of flow through the nose does not change significantly. But if you correct internal valvular incompetence by either dorsal grafts or spreader grafts, you double airflow. You fix external valves that are incompetent by bracing the ailer wall so it doesn't collapse, you double airflow. And if you fix both sets of valves, <clears throat> excuse me, you get three or four times as much flow. So the effects are additive. <clears throat> these patients, in these patients, the 600 patients study, 95% were subjectively normal after one operation. Valvular obstruction in these patients was four times more common than septal obstruction in primary patients and 12 times more common in secondary patients because most rhinoplasties damage the valves. None of these patients had turbinectomies were performed. If they needed turbinectomy, they were excluded. I also was able to measure sidewall stiffness and spreader dorsal and ailer wall grafts all in increase the sidewall measurably, sidewall stiffness measurably. The longer you measure patients, the better the improvement. So as edema resolves, the airway opens up. And primary patients get more airflow and more improvement than secondary patients in five of the seven airway obstructive sites we examined, which means that every single patient should breathe better postoperatively, never worse. Now, what causes valvular incompetence? There's only two things for the internal valves and two for the external. In the internal valves, the middle third can be congenitally narrow, or the surgeon can resect the cartilaginous roof more than two millimeters. That's all it takes to open the cartilaginous fault, which means now the sidewalls are unsupported and they will fall toward the septal edge. Spreader grafts push them back out again or, or maintain the position of the sidewall where you want it. That's why they work. The external valves can be congenitally malpositioned or cephalically rotated, or the surgeon can resect enough lateral crust that it no longer braces the ailer wall and the sidewall becomes floppy. If you have a narrow middle vault like this and you resect the roof, what happens is exactly what you would expect. The middle third caves in. You see this, this inverted V deformity, and her airway is less than 25, less than 50% of what it was before the surgeon operated. And spreader grafts will brace the sidewalls, pull them back out again. You have another nose, a straight dorsum in this case, with a, with a broader middle third. The same thing happens when you resect the middle third. So if you look, and, and the same here, another narrow nose um, with the sidewalls, the dorsum resected, tip cartilage is resected. You see the pinched middle third and the pinched ailer walls. 
These are all secondary patients of mine. You see the same things happen. These patterns recur over and over again, and I want them to become familiar to you because when you resect the roof, the middle third sinks in if the skin is thin enough to show it. If you resect enough alar wall or alar cartilage, then the sidewall collapses and you get notching of the sidewalls. Spreader grafts are physiologic because they allow a movement of the sidewall but resistance. You need resistance on inspiration to open the alveoli. You need resistance on exhalation in order to allow CO2 and, car and uh, oxygen transfer to occur. It occurs on exhalation, not inspiration. So if you resect the roof, the sidewalls will fall in like this. Spreader grafts restore the natural anterior width of the septal edge and will push the sidewall out and they double airflow. So here is how you make spreader graft tunnels. So now let's do spreader graft tunnels through an intercartilaginous incision. This is the septal angle right there, so I'll infiltrate on each side. going to incise down to septal cartilage, just like doing a septoplasty. You've got to be in the right plane section there. So there's bare cartilage. And the same thing over here. My goal is to get, I want to push the upper lateral out, so I want it to be as high along the septal wall as I can be without coming through the dorsal edge. If you're in the right space, it, you can tell by the way it feels that you're in the right space. Section here. Okay, so I made a tight tunnel. I can feel right where I am. If I look over here, I don't see the elevator, so I'm in the right space. Uh, so this is the tunnel for the left-sided spreader graft. The sep septum is right there. And then I'll turn it over and do the same thing on this side. I'm right on cartilage. And Donna Morton, who's helping me, is holding this up so I can see that I'm not breaking through the dorsal edge, although I can feel that. So there's the other spreader graft tunnel. So these grafts, when they go in, won't need to be fixed because there's no place for them to go. Making those tunnels does not take a lifetime of dedication to learn. I was just at Wake Forest as the, one of the Aesthetic Society traveling professors, and I gave this lecture and went to the cadaver lab of the residents, and they all did it right away. And this is pacing the spreader grafts. This is the strip I took with the button knife. You can't uh, plan for stuff like this. This piece is bigger, this one's narrower, and that's exactly what I need. I need asymmetrically thick grafts. But they don't need to be long. They only need to bridge the gap from the caudal edge of the bony arch to the cephalic edge of the lower lateral cartilage, which is only that distance in her. So we'll trim those and put those in, and then put our dorsal graft on and our tip grafts. Raising the dorsum will also make the nose look narrower from the front. So here's the septal angle. Don't pull quite so hard, right here. You can see both spreader graft tunnels. This is the one on her left. And the graft goes right in. There's no place it can go except there, so it doesn't need to be sutured. And here's the other one, which I want to be a little thicker. That's a little too much thicker. It's very easy to find reports on the internet of uh, patients who think the spreader grafts have made the nose too wide, and they shouldn't. And you can tell that you've done it right if you look at the nose and feel it after you put the spreader graft in. It ought to feel perfect and look straight. Don't pull quite so hard. So here's the right-sided tunnel. I'm pointing it in with the concavity slightly toward me because I don't want to create a bump on the sidewall. And this baby goes right in there. Okay. So now, we lift her head. Just the spreader grafts has made her more symmetrical. 
So anytime I open the roof, I play spreader grafts, anytime, because I want to control where the sidewall is going to be. Particularly if you've got a nose like this, and this is two years postoperatively, if you have a narrow middle third and you don't put spreader grafts in patients like this, the airway will be crippled afterwards. The only exception to that is if you need a big dorsal graft. You don't need both spreader grafts and dorsal grafts because they both do the same thing. The dorsal graft acts just the reverse of what happens when you reduce the dorsum. You lift the dorsal skin, pulls on the sidewalls, pulls out the upper laterals, and you see right on the table the effect of opening the internal valves. Now, the lower third is uh, braced at the external valves, mostly positioned by the, uh, controlled by the position of the lateral crus. Anatomy books show you that most lateral crura have this kind of axis going out toward the lateral canthus, but about half the population has a lateral crus that is rotated up like this, what Sheen called malposition. He thought it was a rare anatomical variation. It isn't. It's half the primary population. So if the axis of the lateral crus is up toward the medial canthus, there's a whole area of the sidewall, the lower third sidewall that has no cartilage in it, and it will collapse on inspiration. And if you resect that lateral crus, or a lot of it, to make this, the tip look better, make a ball tip look better, a box tip look better, the, uh, the sidewall will deform. So here are, on the top row, four primary patients, and there's the axis of the lateral crus you see. It's very common, cleft side on a, uh, on a cleft nose is always malpositioned, ball tips, box tips are, are mostly malpositioned. And in the bottom row, you see four secondary patients, and you can see what the remnants are. You see that these patients had malpositions, and you see what happens to the rim. If the skin is thin enough, it will retract and deform. If you have someone like this with malpositioned lateral crura, and you resect lateral crus, the sidewall caves in, creases develop, and the ailer wall retracts. And if you brace the sidewalls, with a piece of cartilage, uh, bracing the area that's soft, that's unsupported, that's all it takes. I, make an, I draw the area of collapse, or the area that's sunken before I start the surgery, and when I get to that point, I make a vestibular incision behind that area, slide a piece of cartilage in that will brace the area of collapse, and it corrects it. So to avoid inadvertently decreasing the airway, place spreader or dorsal grafts, if the middle vault is narrow or if you open the roof. Maintain enough lateral crus to support the sidewall and then diagnose the position of the lateral crus and brace any areas that are unsupported. There's one more principle I want to tell you about. Let me stipulate that in, underneath all these noses, as I've operated on all these people, the skeleton is perfectly straight. The dorsum is totally straight and smooth and the tip cartilages are perfectly symmetrical and exactly um, the right shape. Why do these noses look like this? Why do they look so awful? The answer is that the skin is not a tablecloth and it will not automatically follow what you do to the skeleton. The skin determines half of the shape of the nose. So if you have skin that can, if the skin could contract indefinitely, if it were a completely passive organ, then supertip deformity would never exist. None of those deformities I showed you would ever exist because the, whatever the, skin, the surgeon did to the skeleton, the skin would reflect. And you wouldn't be able to correct supertip deformity by augmenting the nose, but that doesn't happen. If any of you have ever lost tip contour or created a supertip deformity, you have exceeded the limits of what that patient's soft tissues will do. You cannot assume that the skin will follow what you do to the skeleton. That's why I need to be able to, to assess the skin response constantly to what I'm doing. Let me show you in this situation. The only places I generally mark are asymmetries or concavities. So she's got a concavity here on each side. And if I don't move the lateral crura like we talked about earlier, I'll fill in that area just to soften this depression here. But I'm not sure that's what we'll do. But what I'd like to show you is the effect of giving her adequate projection or giving her radix height on the way the nose looks. So I'm going to just put my fingers here to guide where the injection goes and then inject into her tip exactly as if I were doing tip grafts. So I'm going to increase her tip projection.
So you see that makes the hump look smaller than it actually is. When the tip is hanging, it looks much worse. If I get the tip out this way, the hump is not as high as it looks. And if I add to that a augmentation of the radix, Now obviously she does need a reduction because the nose is very big, but if I put a sliver up here and I'm planning to raise the radix and the base. See the hump is still there, but it's not as enormous as it looks. So this is going to come up to the right level. This needs to come down. In fact, almost not at all. I, you could, in theory, leave this and leave her a little bit of height here, bring the tip forward, reduce the tip. She wanted to keep some dorsal height, as some people deliberately do. She doesn't. You could raise this, leave her a little bit of height here, because this is almost flat, uh, give her better tip projection, and stop. Because so much of her deformity and the apparent height here is because this is so deep and this is so flat. So with these anatomy that I've told you about, and the principles are not respected. Deformities to result, but there are only three kinds of secondary deformities. Everything you see will fall into one of those categories. The first pattern is deformities from soft tissue contraction. It's primarily losing tip support. You get a very brown, blunt, contracted, soft, thickened soft tissues. The second pattern is primarily structural, skeletal. It's from valvular collapse at the middle and lower thirds. So what dominates in these patients is a skeletonizing of the nose, retraction and distortion of the cartilages. And the third pattern of secondary deformity are deformities from imbalance, where the parts of the nose look like they don't fit together. And the patient in the upper left, the bridge is too high for the size of the base. And the patient in the upper high, right, the bridge is too low for the size of the base. They look like they ought to belong to two different people. So these are the four core principles I just told you about and what happens if you don't pay attention to them. This is the first one is inadequate tip projection. If you don't have adequate tip projection, the threat is super tip deformity. The treatment is tip grafts. If you have a narrow middle vault or you resect the roof, the, the threat is an internal valvular obstruction and the treatment is spreader or dorsal grafts. If you have a malposition, the threat is external valvular obstruction, and the, the treatment is to reposition the lateral crust or brace the area of a collapse. And if you have a low radix or low dorsum, the threat is imbalance, and the treatment is a dorsal or radix graft. So here's your soft tissue pattern, here's your skeletal pattern, and here's the imbalance pattern. The three patterns of secondary deformities I just showed you are all connected back to the four anatomical variations that I showed you and to the two original goals of a straight balanced profile and stable sidewalls. And these are the treatments you need for them. Tip grafts, spreader grafts, dorsal or radix grafts, which are the same thing in different lengths, and ailer wall grafts. Only four different techniques you need to learn if you want to correct these problems. So the way I look at rhinoplasty is to remove or replace the deformed anatomy primary or secondary cases, harvest building materials, and then I use basically one of two patterns, radix spreader and tip grafts, or dorsal grafts and tip grafts. And I add ailer wall grafts if the side wall is collapsing. Each one, each of those techniques works every time if I do it correctly. The reason they work is that most noses that have a high bridge also have inadequate tip projection and a large nasal base, they're unbalanced. So you need radix spreader and tip grafts. Most patients with a low dorsum, primary low dorsum, or an over-resected bridge also have imperfect tip shapes. So dorsal and tip grafts fix them. And I'll show you examples. This is of both of those uh, uh, methods. This is the way they look in schematics. The only differences between the two on the left uh, and the two on the right are what I've done to the tip cartilages, radix spreader tip grafts or dorsal grafts and tip grafts. I don't use any of these other things. I don't use any struts. I don't use any tip sutures. I don't use any temporalis fascia or dice cartilage or extension grafts um, because I don't think they're, from what I need to do, they're necessary. And it gives me a lot of advantages in revisions and corrections of, of complications, which I'll show you in a minute. This is a classic radix spreader tip graft 
patient. So as you see each of these patients, think where the radix should be, what's tip projection, what's the stability of the middle vault, or how will it be affected by what I do, what's the axis of the lateral crus. This is the patient. Well, essentially, she, of course, she, she's got a high bump, and the high door bridge is too high. That's what's in excess. The nose is too long. The tip is too wide. Now, what's deficient? The middle vault is not deficient now, but it will be the minute I take the hump off. Ehler wall support, you can see there's a hollow on the far right picture where the, because the lateral crura are cephalically rotated. The radix is too low, because, and that is important because the base looks too big, and the tip hangs off the septal angle. So if you look, think of the, where the ideal is, you can immediately see what's deficient in this nose. The radix has to be higher, the bump has to go down, tip has to project more and have a different contour, and the middle vault needs to be stable. So here she is in the operating room. I marked out the area of the ader wall graft. This is just the dorsal reduction of the bony hump. This is the whole dorsum reduced. There's the septal specimen spreader grafts, radix graft. So this is after the dorsal reduction. Now watch what happens after I put the radix graft in. You see it change immediately. The base looks smaller because this area has been augmented. And then the Ehler wall grafts, the two little pieces at the top are going to be my tip grafts. And this is at the end of the surgery, and that's where we began. Radix spreader tip Ehler wall grafts. And I can see exactly how much tip projection I've, I've gotten in that patient. So here she is at three months and at 15 months. After exactly that plan, the tip's still her tip. It's a little narrower, but not much different. Middle third is stable, looks slightly narrower. The radix is the right height. The nose looks better balanced. Tip is now adequately projecting at 15 months. And there's the immediate post-operative picture, so you see how close it is. If I have, if I have read the soft tissues correctly, there is very little post-operative change. Same on this view, the middle third is stable. And from below, the hollow that she had on the left side has been fixed by the Ehler wall grafts. The only areas that I uncover are areas that patients have asked me to change. So in this patient, I uncovered that area to get at the bony hump and the, and the cartilaginous dorsum and to put spreader grafts in, those areas to reduce the lateral crura, those areas to brace the ailer walls, and that to put my tip grafts in. Everything else is untouched, which minimizes the chance that I can do something I don't want to do. Every one of these patients had, it has iatrogenic deformities that had nothing to do with the patient's original goals, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Some of these problems are uncorrectable, so far to me right now at least. And this is the classic dorsal tip graft strategy. It's a patient with a very big super tip deformity. The base is big, the tissues are unsupported. If you compare to the ideal, it's pretty obvious. I need to raise the upper dorsum and do something to correct tip shape. So what I'm going to do is the dorsal graft, tip graft, to correct super tip deformity, which was the the procedure that made Jack Sheen so famous uh, almost 40 years ago. Here's this is the rib cartilage in this patient. And four years later, the, the nose is slightly narrower. Uh, the dorsum is higher and longer, so all that tissue without any resection has been redraped into a different position. These are exactly the same focal length. It's not a photographic trick. And this is the shape at the end of the surgery. On oblique view, the base still looks smaller because the dorsum is higher. And from below, her airways are more open, but you see the rib graft, which still, which still uh, deceives me sometimes. The left ailer wall graft is distorted slightly, so she's not quite symmetrical. I still can't get rib to work the way I want. These anatomical points are, and strategies work the same, whether it's a primary nose or a secondary nose, because the goals are the same. The only difference is the donor site. And often when I hear residents present cases, they say to me, well, I see a ball tip, I see a box tip, I see inadequate projection. The one thing they don't tell me is what the patient has said they don't like. And that's the point I want to make here. These two patients I'm going to show you have different goals. First thing this patient told me was she liked her tip, so I did very little to it. The first patient thing this patient told me was she hated her tip. That was her number one problem. So I'm going to be more aggressive in that patient, move the tip cartilages, uh, try to change the configuration to, to get rid of the grooves and so on. It, uh, 
It's very important to listen to what the patient's complaints are before you decide your strategy. Don't make a diagnosis without listening to what the patient tells you. If you, some surgeons say, but you can't see the anatomy if you don't open the nose. Yes, you can, because all the things I've told you about, you can decide either from looking at the surface or from your internal examination. I always show a cleft because surgeons tell me you can't, you can't do clefts closed. I do. Uh, this is an in progress. You're still doing, looking for the same things, symmetry, balance, um, airway. Uh, this, the cleft patients need little different things than others. They need maxillary augmentations often. They will need composite grafts for vestibular stenoses or procedures for the ailer walls. I still need to do something for the ailer web on the right side and some other additional things for her symmetry. But everything else has been done endonasally, and it still gives me the same advantages of not being able to read the soft tissues and not create new deformities. The complications are very low. I test everybody for MRSA, but if, I've, if in this case this is a, happens to be a forehead flap, but as it healed, it healed with excessive tip projection. So I took the tip grafts out, revised them, and redid them again. The only thing that can happen to my grafts is either I don't put enough in or too much or they move out of position. In this case, I didn't put enough in. Her side wall is still flat. She, if she ever asked me to revise, it will be simple to fix that. But all the anatomy is still there. In this patient, the dorsal graft slid out of position. You can see there's a notch there. So at a year, I dissected it free, moved it up, taped it down. It's easy. And if a patient tells me, I hate everything you ever did, I wish I'd never met you, which a couple have, I can take all the grafts out and they go right back to where they were because there's no sutures, there's no struts, there's nothing else. So if you look for all these various kinds of goals of a straight dorsum and competent valves, those two strategies, plus or minus, will correct an awful lot of what you see. There's one other advantage of limiting your dissection that I haven't gotten to, and that is safety. This is a woman, a patient I shared with Joel Feldman, who's a fantastic surgeon. This is a woman who was a, was a graduate student at Northwestern when she leaned over her stove and her blouse caught on fire. And the blouse was a nylon-rayon combination, so it sticks to your skin like napalm. And she was 60% total body burns, from, essentially from her mid-thigh to her hairline. Kept alive on a ventilator for three months while they grafted her there. And then Joel Feldman took over and did miraculous work in a number of procedures, getting everything fixed up, lips, nose, and so on, forehead flap. And then he sent her to me and said, can you do something else to make the nose better? Now, everything on this woman is either scar or skin graft or flap. So I don't want to lose a single mitochondria doing this surgery. I know I need to fix her vestibular stenosis with transposition flaps. So I am doing everything else through those operations, the tip, the dorsum, the side walls. And postoperatively, you see still, as careful as I was, how pink the tip got. Uh, it even started to blister in one area. I didn't lose any soft tissue. Um, but finally, this is the final result, but that was despite two basically rim incisions through which I did the whole operation. On profile, I did not very, have to do very much to what he did because he had done such a fantastic job. And this is her original vestibular problem, opening the vestibular stenosis, but you see how red the tissues got. Um, but I finally got the airway open. Uh, passably enough, so she's got a much better airway. But I'm, I'm, it's a very important to maintain control over the soft tissues. The, the skin is not an inviolable, and this is like radiated skin, and so is the skin of many of your tertiary patients. I'm told by the residents that they are taught to put composite grafts in if they lose calumellar skin. Is that not crazy? Well, why are we thinking about how to treat soft tissue when we lose it in a cosmetic operation? It doesn't even make sense to me. I never want to lose soft tissue. Now, I want to finish by talking about one other thing, which is patient safety, because people don't talk about it very much and happens to be an interest of mine right now. The question is, what would you have to do to babies like this to make them into adults that look like this? Really stunning. These are all my patients. <laughs> I'm ashamed to tell you. Um, the answer, a big part of the answer, is childhood abuse and neglect. I, a couple of years ago, I spoke about this, and I published data at, in uh, PRS that indicates that if a patient has had more than three cosmetic operations and a rhinoplasty, a tertiary rhinoplasty, where the original nose was normal, meaning 
No bump, no airway problem, no asymmetry, but the patient had surgery anyway because they didn't feel perfect enough. Obviously, that's body dysmorphic disorder. The likelihood of childhood abuse or neglect in that patient population is over 90%. And my chances of making them totally happy in one operation is under 3%. So I identified the connection between childhood abuse and neglect and our most unhappy patients, but I didn't know what kind of trauma it was. So with two of the residents at UW, I'm working on this. We're about to put together data on 166 consecutive patients. And this is uh, in uh, uh, my practices. This group is 86% aesthetic, 14% reconstructive. There was a prototype medical general population, medical middle class general medical population, mostly white or Hispanic uh, in California at the Kaiser Permanente with the same exact survey. In this group, 64% had at least one positive answer of 10 different types of major childhood, repetitive childhood abuse or neglect before the age of 18. In my patients who are not a disadvantaged population, most of whom are professionals and college graduates, the prevalence is 80%. And where we are double the prevalences of the general medical population are in emotional abuse. You're stupid, you're ugly, you're never going to amount to anything. 50%, that's twice what it was in the California study. Emotional neglect, nobody feeling, feeling like you're unloved, nobody cares about you. We're living with a drug abuser or alcoholic. In every other area of, of abuse, uh, the prevalences were almost to the letter, the number exactly the same. The, what childhood trauma can do is create shame. That's the ubiquitous sequelae of poor parenting. I'm defective, there's something wrong with me. The minute you connect that shame to your appearance, which is the commonest thing to do, you start looking for ways to fix it. And if you're a teenager and you hate the way you look, what are you gonna, what are you gonna select? You're too young for a facelift. You're too young to have your eyelids done. It's gonna be a rhinoplasty, which is probably one of the reasons rhinoplasty patients are so difficult. But these patients end up in our offices with very low self-esteem. They need a lot of extra time and attention from our, for our staff and from us. They become perfectionistic or obsessive or adopt unhealthy or addictive behaviors. Or they don't understand moderation or judgment. They keep going even if they've had multiple complications. They keep having operations. Or that they, in the worst cases, make up if they don't um, get what they want, that we're just another abuser. And these are the really malignant people that bother you in the office or go on the internet. Well, I, the way I understand this from having read the literature, I've read more than, believe it or not, 500 mental health papers and 60 textbooks to try to, to educate myself over the last four years to understand this problem, is that the sequelae of childhood abuse and neglect creates a shame core in some people, not in everybody. Resilient patients, uh, which are many of my patients, can have had horrible childhoods and yet be the most wonderful, most happy, most pleasant, most grateful patients. So childhood trauma is not a screen for operating on people because resilience is the antidote to childhood trauma and that's really where the human spirit comes in. But if you don't have resilience and you develop this shame core, it disperses into a variety of different kinds of unhealthy behavior or personality problems, or PTSD, or depression, or eating disorders, and, or perfectionism, or various kinds of addictions, including plastic surgery. One of the interesting things about this survey in California was that they found not only that childhood abuse and neglect was very common, even in, an, uh, in a privileged population, but that the more positive answers you had, the more childhood abuse and neglect you had, the more health problems you had as an adult more obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, and so on. All the big killers, cancer, primary pulmonary fibrosis, multiple sclerosis, and so on. All of these uh, uh, big killers are directly related to the prevalence of childhood abuse in your, in your uh, uh, background. So one thing my research has taught me is that addictions are not weaknesses. They are solutions to medicate pain, and that means includes obesity, morbid obesity. Um, uh, these patients are, the reason patients have so much trouble giving up addictions or losing weight is because the, being obese is a solution for them, it's not a problem. 
So my criteria for surgery are still the same ones they have always been. They're really tests for maturity. Do I see what the patient sees? Can I personally fix it? Is the patient manageable? Is it someone that I can get through surgery? If there's a complication, will the patient understand and let me fix it, or are they too high strung to tolerate anything but an imperfection? And most of all, can the patient accept that the margin of error in surgery is always a margin of error in surgery, that our goal is not perfection but the best possible surgical result? This is a sunset from one of my favorite places in Arizona. Thank you all very much. See if there's questions. Peter, thank you. Mark, uh, first rate. Um, I learned so much. We have a little time for questions. If you just come to the microphone. Yes, sir. We would Kansas no disclosures. Very interested in your talk, Dr. Constantian. Unfortunately, I think we all experience body dysmorphic patients, and childhood neglect is so subjective and unfortunately so ubiquitous. I think you mentioned 160 some patients. Were those patients with body dysmorphic disorder? And did you compare, no, they weren't. Did you compare them to another group of patients, such as other patients having cosmetic surgery? As a con did you have any sort of control group? Yeah, no, those were 166 consecutive patients. Okay. And they are consecutive post-operative patients because for two reasons. One, I didn't want to give out the survey in the waiting room. Patients aren't expected, expecting to answer those questions when they see me. Second, I wanted to be able to put all these patients in context. I wanted to know something about them. So some months or sometimes years after surgery, when they came back to see me, I'd tell them about the survey and ask them if they'd be willing to do it. Amazingly, nobody turned me down. Anybody had to be over 21. And a couple of patients I didn't ask because they were so ticked off at me, I didn't think they'd give the right answer. But those, so these are consecutive patients. Um, in general, the aesthetic patients are much harder to please than the reconstructive patients, and they also have higher uh, childhood trauma scores. The rhinoplasty patients are harder than the other aesthetic patients. The secondary and tertiary rhinoplasty patients are harder than the primary rhinoplasty patients, pretty much what you would expect. But the, the trauma score did not correlate with likelihood of patient being happy. Um, the, and, and it also did not correlate with the resilience score. The resilience score was one I gave the patient based on how well I thought they were functioning in their lives how they behaved, how much pain medication they needed, how, um, how much demand they put on the staff, how happy they were after surgery, how easy it was to get them through the whole process. And I, w I had expected that the patients that were the nicest, most wonderful people had the easiest childhoods. That often wasn't true. There's no connection. And so this started out to be um, an effort to find out why our irrational patients are so difficult. And it turned out to be a story about why some people are resilient. Very different. Thank you. Thank you very next. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Rubin. Uh, that was really a wonderful presentation, one of the clearest I've had the privilege to hear. And you talked about the fact that largely a lot of the factors we thought were important in fat grafting or fat transplantation are probably not so important, right? The size of the cannula, the way you handle the fat, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that you didn't really address uh, a lot, and I was wondering about some thoughts, is manipulation of the recipient site. You know, because Roger has done all this stuff with Brava and other things to try to increase the ability of recipient fights to accept the graft. And I wonder if you might talk about that. Sure. So that, that's uh, certainly one of the important variables and a, and a great question. I didn't spend a lot of time on the recipient site, uh, but Roger and, and has taught us uh, over time that that uh, expansion, external expansion of the recipient site can really <clears throat> alter the skin envelope to be more compliant as well as increase vascularity. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, one of the common ways we're always manipulating the recipient site in difficult cases is through uh, scar release, uh, and, and I think that's a very important factor uh, as well. You know, there are a lot of uh, other ways that we can do that through uh, pharmacologic priming. Of the, of the recipient bed, just like we delay flaps. Uh, that's something that we're looking at in the laboratory. So there are a lot of other strategies, uh, but compared to all the other things that we're doing, uh, there hasn't been as much attention paid to that, uh, mostly because there aren't as many interventions as we have clinic, that we have clinically available right now, but it's definitely a target of opportunity. 
On, on that note, a, a, a comment, Peter, as far as the face goes, the recipient side has often been manipulated. The patients have had filler, they've had ultrasound, they've had thermage, so their microcirculation is compromised. Um, there's a presence of foreign material they're often not telling you about, and I, I sometimes wonder if this gets factored into even some of our studies. Patients are not always forthcoming about what they've previously done to their face. And there, there are no virgins anymore. Um, there is no face that hasn't had some of that done to it. Um, usually they're coming for fat grafting after they've tried everything else. That's a great point. Often those are more hostile wound environments than we, than we think. Another question? Or, I'm sorry, you were next. Thank you. It's on that theme. Uh, I was just wondering what your opinion is on adding things to the fat, proangiogenic pro things like erythropoietin or anti-inflammatory and anti-apoptotic uh, things such as P38 inhibitors. So I, there, there is a, you know, a, a, so many additives that people have been using from PRP, uh, which can be helpful, but uh, is also adds a lot of cost. Uh, I, I think, again, it's another great target of opportunity is pharmacologic interventions that we can use to increase fat grafting. I mean, one of the best strategies I've, I've seen lately is that uh, P188 surfactant, uh, because it's very inexpensive, it's non-toxic, it stabilizes the lipid membranes, uh, and uh, that's something that we'll probably uh, see more of in the, in the future. Uh, you know, a lot of this is really limited by regulatory uh, constraints and understanding, you know, what can we put in, what's the safety profile, and what's going to, what's going to work well. But a, a great question and another great target of opportunity. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Beatrice Berenger from Madrid. Congratulations for both excellent educational lectures. Uh, Peter, you mentioned that there are individual factors for fat uh, retaining, retainers. Uh, have those factors been studied? Is, is it age? Is it BMI? What makes a certain individual retain more than other? And also, a, a very specific question, what does TELFA rolling mean? So the, the answer to the first question, uh, we, we have shown experimentally that the native concentration of uh, progenitor stem cells, CD34 positive cells, will correlate with fat graft survival, and that makes sense because those are the most bioactive cells. Now, what controls that, those differences in patient to patient, we don't have nearly enough data uh, to look at that yet, and that's a uh, very expensive study to do flow cytometry on that many people and correlate it with medical comorbidity, is although something I'd love to try and get funded and do in the future. And could you repeat the second question, please? Yeah. You said that you prepare low volumes of fat with TELFA rolling? Yes. Can you explain what that is? Oh, sure. That's a, just a very simple technique of uh, taking the aspirated fat, uh, putting it onto a telfa gauze, which is, has a non-stick layer, non-adherent layer on it, and then it's perforated with absorbent gauze underneath, and then you roll it with the back of a uh, scalpel blade uh, for about two minutes, and that really dehydrates the, the fat and removes a lot of the oil. And it's very efficient for, for really small volumes, you know, several cc's. Uh, five cc's or so. Uh, it's very, very efficient. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, three minutes. Just uh, Barry Strauss from New York. Just a point of information, Peter. The article you cited in the New York Times, uh, the details of it were published in the New England Journal of Medicine last week. And yes. We shoot ourselves in the foot all the time. Uh, Alfonso, I think we can get your question yeah, in. Very, very short uh, comment. Alfonso Barrera from Houston. Uh, to uh, Dr. Constantin. It's an amazing presentation. I congratulate you for the, the skill that you have shown us time and time again for many years. And uh, this reminds me, uh, I, I usually do most of my rhinoplasties endonasally, close because, uh, because I'm a little bit of an older generation. But I'm glad that you mentioned that there's a lot of young people here. And when I have residents come and rotate in my office and I'm doing a rhinoplasty, they're so pleasantly surprised that they're going to see an endonasal rhinoplasty because most of them only have seen open rhinoplasties. That's right. And this is a great, uh, I, I congratulate you for doing this and great results every time. And um, again, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers. Two excellent talks.